Welcome to the first lecture in a semester-long series. You see our, what I think is a fantastic poster before you, um, a series on political imaginaries across Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, this is one of the Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies interdisciplinary colloquia. We offer one of these every semester and organize a series of lectures that bring together interdisciplinary audiences to focus on a particular theme. We are usually fortunate, as we are tonight, to have very distinguished visitors come and, uh, and uh, guide us through, through these topics and share their work with us. So I invite you um, to know what's coming up and to put it, put it in your calendars. Um, I'm Jill Lane. I direct the Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies, and uh, I really I welcome you here tonight. Thank you so much for coming. Um, this particular series is, um, has been put together by three faculty members at the Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies. Uh, one of them is Pamela Calla, who is uh, going to stand up in a moment and introduce our distinguished guest. Uh, another is Edgardo Perez Morales, who's hiding in the back, <laughs> and uh, Catherine Smith, who's up here in the front, and I thank them for their work in bringing this series together. It is uh, really imaginative and has set a, a very wide range of questions for us to think about this semester. And among the topics that, uh, as you can see, if you can see the tiny print there, among the, the larger questions um, are, um, well, I guess really what, what is a political imaginary? How is it uh, shaped? Um, what is the relationship um, between social movements, processes of globalization, uh, the nation state in, the, in this context, a very broad, open set of questions that can be answered um, uh, in very interesting ways by scholars from, from uh, different disciplines. Among our guests is uh, Professor Aisha Khan from NYU, who I think is also hiding in the audience back there. Um, wonderful opportunity to, to hear her work as well. Um, so um, I will add my own thanks to the thanks I know Pamela will extend uh, uh, to you, Irene. Thank you so much for coming. It is a huge honor to have you uh, kick off this series. And um, I will now hand things over to Boy Lacalla, who will give you a proper introduction. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Um, I'm really glad you're here, Irene. Oh, I have been reading you for a long time, so it's a <laughs> pleasure to meet you. And you're, as uh, most people know, a professor of cultural anthropology, history, and women's studies at U Duke University. You research the cultural dimensions of power, state building, and colonization in Latin America, as well as the politics of memory in Central Europe. So your publications are various, and the ones that uh, that you want us to highlight is poetry, a life of a life cut short collected poetry of Selma Bermond Elsinger. Um, uh, and then where you introduce the book. Then the book that I use in all my classes, Modern Inquisitions, um, Peru and the Colonial Origins of, civilized of the Civilized World. And the other one that I also use in all my classes mm -hmm. is Moon, Sun, and Witches, Gender Ideologies and Class in Inca and Colonial Peru. Um, that book has been read widely by many people. And I want to highlight um, that you were in Bolivia 2011 or 12 uh, in contemporary debates with colleagues and friends of mine talking about decolonizing and depatriarchalizing the state and society in Bolivia. Thank you for going there, discussing with, with colleagues and friends such an important uh, issue, topic. Um, and thanks for being here. Oh. I also want to introduce St. Clair, our dearest colleague, who's also a Bolivianista. Um, as we know, he lived and worked in Bolivia for the longest time. I met you in 1983. Um, so we go a long way back. And um, um, he has a very important uh, book that has also been translated uh, into Spanish. and. All the people in, in, at the universities in Bolivia read it. We Alone Will Rule, who looks at Indian and peasant politics and anti-colonial insurgency in the 18th century Andes. And then um, you were present in Bolivia 
2003 and 2005 where all the rebellions and all those struggles were going on that led to the presidency of Evo Morales. And from that book uh, with Forrest Hilton, you wrote Revolutionary Horizons to understand Bolivia's contemporary conflicts in a deeper historical light. And your current research explores the subsequent repercussions of the revolution of Tupac Katari and Tupac Amaro in 1780-1781. And we also thank you for being here and having accepted commenting on Irene Silverbats. So deeply moved, I don't know where to start. I've had the most fortunate life to have friends that have helped my soul and have helped my mind. And I've found these friends in many places, like here at NYU, and so many of you here are in my heart. And of course, the very special times that I was able to spend in the Andes, in Peru, and also uh, most recently in Bolivia with Mujeres Creando, um, <laughs> who of course invited me to come and then who taught me so much about the world and about myself. And being able to talk to you again about some of the work I've done on colonial Peru has reminded me how much we see differently as we look at the past with new eyes. And especially, I think, with the eyes of today as we're dealing with questions of politics and identities and especially the kinds of racial formations that um, ground so much of, of our, our world today. So I'd like to... Um, Jump in then, and please don't hesitate to raise your hands, and you will, you know, <clears throat> you'll forgive me, but I've come to be of a certain age that sometimes um, eyes don't work like you'd hope they do, and I did something really, I shouldn't go into all this, but I really did something really stupid, and I forgot my glasses, so if I uh, <coughs> mumble a little bit or kind of, it's, it's because of my eyes. Okay, so um, I want to look at race thinking, the whole project of race thinking, and how it grounded Spanish colonial rule, which is to say how it became part of the making of our modern world. Race thinking structured the new categories of humanness, a new vision of the makeup of humankind that was to shape 16th century Indian colonialism. But it provided a framework as well as a moral voice to myths that turn our eyes from the global structures of exploitation and privilege at the heart of colonial rule. This site might sound familiar, the um, mythologies of race thinking, because they are also so important in framing our own modern world as we are experiencing now. Our great social theorists have talked about modernity in light of the state, its bureaucracies, and its constituents, its constituents called individuals. What they have forgotten or overlooked is that European state making was, changed, was chained to overseas expansion, that modernity was born in this dialectic of state making and colonialism, and that race thinking was at the core of this process. Our very modern ways of being and perceiving are rooted in Spain's pioneering exercise in global political subjection. And race thinking structured the new kind of human being, the new categories of humanness shaping modern life. Race thinking etched privileges of power and economic do domination, the privileges of colonialism, on global geographies and on human bodies. It also, like magic, made a blueprint of subjection seem to disappear. 
So this talk puts colonialism at the heart of modern experience, and my framework owes much to Hannah Arendt's account of the origins of fascism and the consequent understanding of what constitutes our modern world. Arendt combed Western history for a precedence that would have paved the way for civilized peoples to embrace Hitler's barbarity. And she found that antecedent in 19th century imperialism, a form of government which, like 20th century fascism, supported the worldwide dominance of a master race. And she identified two dimensions of colonial control that would have led, uh, laid the groundwork for the horrors to follow. One was a bureaucratic administrative rule serving colonial interests and not the interests of those governed. And the other was, a kind, was racial ideologies, which she called race thinking, that turned bureaucrats into members of a superior white European caste with authority that could cross oceans and continents. This would be the precursor to the master race. Arendt's foreboding insight was that intertwined race thinking and bureaucratic rule would unleash extraordinary power and destruction, precisely in her words, because governance and its inherent violence were hidden by the projections of rationality and civilization, shimmering in a coat of racial supremacy. Arendt called this hidden dimension of modernity the West's subterranean stream, a violence, I would add, that was routine colonial experience, but hidden by metropolitan delusions until erupting in, fa in fascism at home. Arendt thus placed colonialism, its hidden violence, its autocratic bureaucracies, and its companion ideologies of race thinking at the heart of modern experience. And of course, she, wasn't, she was one of several uh, important thinkers who put colonialism and the eruption of fascism together, including Cesare May, who talked about uh, fascism, colonialism has come home. Arendt believed that colonialism's governing principles were launched in the 19th century by the English and French. So here we challenge Arendt's chronology and her political geography. Beginning in the 16th century, Spain was installing cutting edge bureaucracies, purveyors of civilization, rational order, and race thinking designs to administer and, go and govern its colonies dispersed throughout the world. If we take the first wave of European empire as a starting point, we have a better grasp, I think, of modernity's persistent illusions. And returning to the 17th century, we can better understand how, under cover, race thinking became part of the modern body politic and how it haunts us still. And while this talk can be suggestive at best, I hope it pushes us to ask why and how our colonial beginnings and their cultural politics are not central to our perceptions of the modern world. Our points of entry will be the contrary meanings of new Christian in the new world with a focus on the Viceroyalty of Peru and various uh, church records from inquisition trials to sermons to juridical guidebooks to campaigns to extirpate idolatry trials will provide our principal sources. And our focus will be on the transformation of the, what had been the Inca Empire into uh, the Viceroyal Peru. And this is <coughs> a map so you get a feeling of more or less the regions. I'll be focusing on primarily the region in the <coughs> Peruvian Andes and uh, Bolivia and Ecuador. So our blindness to the contrary, history wedded European state building to European colonialism. And Spain is perhaps the prototype of this double-edged politics. Castilian monarchs were vying to increase their authority over the Iberian Peninsula when they triumphed in the Americas, struggling to control Iberian principalities, fighting, fighting the Ottomans while they worked out details of colonial government, battling the English when they established Indian courts, skirmishing with the Dutch when they defended colonial borders. Um, to, but to make 
a colony out of what had been the Inca Empire was an extended process. It took decades after the conquest itself to successfully root complex institutions of government that would transform the continent. Spain's imperial enterprise sought the new world's wealth and labor. However, uh, the colonial empire and its institutions were only brought to life by making new kinds of uh, human beings, by making new kinds of social relationships, and creating new social identities. Again, these new kinds of human beings, a new imagination of what our world should look like. Like all bureaucratic administrations, colonial Peru's functioned through a cultural ma matrix, and race thinking was at its core. Grounded in the emergency, in the um, exigencies of an emerging modern state, royal, royal authorities, oops. Royal, the emerging modern, uh, let me start. Grounded in the exigency of, of an emerging modern state, royal authorities divided humanity into broad, abstract categories as the foundation of colonial rule. And let me just, do I just flip on the, uh, there you go. There's a capital of a bureaucratic center if I ever saw one. That's, um, <laughs> <laughs> that's this early 17th century drawing by Juan Palma de Ayala of, of Lima, where you see the major bureaucratic institutions highlighted, the church, the state buildings, Grounded in the, okay, so, um, so these were the broad abstract categories that were emerging at this period. They're abstract. Okay. You had privileged Spanish colonists <coughs> who were descendants of Iberia, who regardless of origin, ethnicity, or rank were classed as such as privileged. You had native peoples, na and which is, I better said, all native peoples except those who were native from Africa and Europe were the other category and their descendants and they were classed as Indians. And then when Indian populations decimated by disease and upheaval could no longer meet labor demands, the crown turned to slavery, spurring the creation of a third abstract category of government. Africans and their descendants were classed as Negroes and blacks or blacks. Reading sermons used as teaching and preaching tools for colonized Indios, I discovered an additional dimension to Western racialized myth-making. The Spanish European version of the world and humanity were now attaching themselves to skin color. And they were attaching skin color to a range of human possibilities that like original birthplace um, were accompanied by other important uh, status definitions, political capacity, moral character, economic standing. So while Spaniard meant white, and while that white meant of European origin, it also meant entitled to political authority, morally superior, and at least in the, and, and at least in the colonies, except from tribute. India, India was glossed as um, of color, de color, colorado, and that meant native to all continents except for Europe and Africa, and Indios were considered a political subaltern, morally suspect, obliged to pay, tri obliged to pay tribute. Negro meant black, and that meant of African origin, politically subordinate, morally weak and slave. Imperial rule transformed the colonial enterprise into a racial play of global geopolitics based in part on appearances. So colonialism transformed humanity, a process making race thinking and physical appearance into the essence of humanness as well as the underlying charter for human potential. It marked out the lines of human control over other human beings. 
Spanish legal theory's flat presentation of political and economic hierarchies concealed the historical processes, the predations, the human costs of colonialism at its heart. In other words, it made history disappear. It made history disappear. So now a look at the, a little look at the, um, what we would call the modern inquisition and their role in um, constructing the practices of race thinking and implementing them. The Inquisition held a special place in Spanish statecraft. Employees of the crown, not the church, inquisitors served as the arbiters of religious orthodoxy in a polity where religion was a political litmus test. Inquisitors were bureaucrats responsible for the empire's cultural, which is to say natural, national security. Inquisitors prosecuted heretics of all sorts, bigamists, blasphemers, fornicators, priests who solicited in the confession box. But it was most well known for battle against heretics, including hidden Jews, Muslims, and Protestants. It was an institution of state that identified nationhood or not, uh, incipient ideas of national belonging by fixing internal cultural boundaries as Spain was jockeying for position in an increasingly globalized world. The Inquisition's mission would appear to have been an internal affair, but in fact, concerns about Catholic preeminence had everything to do with the political and ideological battles that were crossing state borders. Spain was fighting infidels and heretics, the Moors and the English, when it was colonizing the Americas. And Spain was also dependent on an increasingly significant international com uh, commerce, which some believed was in the hands of perfidious new Christians, um, hidden Jews called Portuguese who claimed to be faithful, but in fact practiced treachery. Um, to give you an example of one of the accusations laid against them to show how they were actually impeding uh, Spanish advance. It was said that um, one inquisitor wrote, and they ruled over trade and commerce in such a way that from gold brocade to sackcloth and from diamond to cumin seed, from the lowest slave of Guinea to the most precious pearl, all passes through their hands. And a Castilian of pure stock, which is to say an old Christian of pure blood and pure Christian ancestry doesn't have a chance. So Spain was a Catholic country. Only Catholics could reside in Spain. But some inquisitors were increasingly suspicious that some so-called Catholics, ostensible Catholics, were undercover practicing the illicit faith of their ancestors. And these were Spain's hidden Jews hidden Muslims and hidden Protestants. Now, administrators in Spain and Spain's colonies used a particular race-thinking notion to shape and calibrate the national order, the natural order of political life. They argued that blood carried stains and that stains could determine character traits, intelligence, political rights, and economic possibilities. Stained blood was said to mark the polluted character of Spain's religious outcasts. Jews and Moors. And it was a trait that many in authority, and this is, but not everyone, believed could be passed down over generations in spite of conversions. After all, for many, conversion is what swept your plate clean. Ibe but Iberia's secret Jews and Moors, the apparently converted, were called new Christians. Some authorities considered them to be a looming threat to national security, and the Inquisition had been established at the end of the 15th century to root out the threat they supposedly posed. Because of the vigilance over these sorts of religious issues, the Inquisition was responsible, in addition, for enforcing purity of blood statutes, measures that restricted political officials and professionals, and professions, rather, to men of pure, untainted stock. In other words, old Christians 
whose blood had not been tainted by traces of Jewish or Moorish blood. These pure bloods were also ethnicized or kind of nationalized and called Castilians. Those with Jewish ancestry were labeled Portuguese. But you might like to see some old Christians. And in order for them to acquire, attain these positions in um, government, they had to show purity of blood um, certificates. Um, Spaniards brought this new Christian curse to the Americas. And, in, and as in Spain, inquisitors were the ultimate judges of blood. So every man and woman brought before the Inquisition was asked to place themselves in the world social order of things. And that meant defining themselves in terms of the formal categories of state. Name, age, place of birth, marital status, social standing, as well as casta y generacion, caste and ancestry. In 17th century colonial courts, casta y generacion usually, re usually referred to Indio, Negro, and Espanol moderated by the mixed things, mestizo, mulatto, and sambo. However, españoles and partly Spanish mestizos and mulatos were also required to specify the nature of their Spanish ancestry, declare if they were old Christians and taintless, or if they were descendants of one of the new Christian subcasts of Jews and Moors. By the 17th century, magistrates and other functionaries were officially dividing people into Spanish, Indian, Black, Mestizo, Mulato, Portuguese, Castilian, New Christian, Old Christian, percentage of Old Christian, percentage of New Christian boxes as a matter of course. And categories were taking on the appearance of things, of self-evident qualities of human being. Abstracting an individual from its foundational social relations, as these abstract categories did, permitted the illusion, an illusion of the state, to appear as the organic creator of these categories, defining and labeling humanity as it called individuals divorced from their social roots to task. Inquisitors, with their census-like questions and confession-like demands, produced individual subjects of Spanish rule through bureaucratic needs and exigencies. And inquisitors also marked caste and the social relations making Indio, Negro, and Espanol also seem to disappear in this accounting. Disappearing histories meant that stripped down individuals were primed to absorb race as if it were an inborn characteristic one with the extraordinary power to shape destinies. Now, race thinking had to be taught, right? And it had to be nurtured and made part of life's experience. And here, um, I want to again go to the Indian countryside. Doctrineros sent to the Indian hinterlands to preach, preach religion to Indians were also pioneering instructors in a pedagogy of race thinking. Colonization was, in good measure, theology, and the, the theology's foundational elements can be found in bilingual Quechua, Quechua Spanish sermons written by and for missionaries sent to do God's work and the state's work in the Indian countryside. In these early 17th century tracts, which are lessons in imperialism, Spaniards presented to Quechua-speaking Andeans, now called Indians, a Spanish take on the emerging modern world and the role that Españoles, Indios, and Negros had in its making. They also articulate the novel global social relations, those of empire and a kind of incipient sense of incipient nationalist sentiments, I can't quite find the right words for this, that were changing Indian life. In the course of sermonizing, the authors, Father Francisco de Avila and Fernando de Avendaño, appealed to nothing less than world history to give Andeans a place in the new transnational order of things. We hear Spanish authorities transport the notion of stained blood to the Americas, and we watch them juggle the related enigma of just 
how a fair God could consider all human beings equal and yet allow such hellish distinctions between human beings on earth. Avila and Avendano preached hierarchy in their sermons. Their task in Peru was to turn old world Aristotelian wisdom based on localized arrangements of power into a globalism, into lessons of modern colonial cultural politics. They had to explain why differences in wealth and privilege were not just local, but were experienced globally and in racialized form. In other words, the doctrineros had to account for the different colores of human being, along with the enormous difference in functions, possibilities, and life chances that these colores entail. They had to explain why Indios, gente colorada, native born, were subservient to white Christians, Spaniards from Europe, yet superior to slaves, Negroes from Africa. And the Dr. Dineros explained it like this, simply put. In the modern global scheme of things, white, black, brown become designations for one's lot in life. This is a short, condensed version. Blacks were created, but these are their words, blacks were created to serve or learn trades or do physical labor or plant fields. Indians were drafted to work in the mines or perform other labor. And continuing their sermon sociobiology lesson, for God, they said, had preached that some men were created to be kings and rule over others, and Spaniards, of course, were the kings and rulers. So um, let's look a little bit at this world's historic vision that preachers are preaching from their sermons. And we'll see how it meshes with the needs and the fears of 17th century, the 17th century Andes. Spanish priests turned to Moros literally Moors and Jews, for lessons of relevance to their Indian mission. In other words, they look to history, but also to history and the present. Preachers turn these harrowing pages from Spanish history into cautionary tales about fidelity and Christian supremacy. The first business, however, was to teach about the Jewish and Muslim devils. A duo Andeans would join if they didn't forswear their idolatries. So first, the fire and brimstone. They said, Moors, Jews, and idol worships were the world's principal heretics, and as such, would be subject to God's terrible wrath. Not only that, but a hellish future was not all that was in store. Idol worshipers, Indians, reduced to the same pitiful status as Moors and Jews, would, like them, also be punished in this world in an inquisitorial fashion. They would die horrible deaths. They would go to the stake. They would be, to repeat Avila's warnings, burned alive. Avila's and, Avi and Avedano's um, preached about, and Avedano's pleas were partially pleased to pre pleas for Andean peoples to pray for Spanish victory over the Moors and the Ottomans to pray for their downfall. And these pleas embraced as well their desire to dominate idol worshiping Indians who were forever backsliding, or as was the case among the vice royalties frontier, impossible to conquer. <clears throat> and in this regard, they resonated with Spain's other internal enemy, the Jews, albeit in a different registry. Jews played a special role in the morality tales transported to Peru. Our evangelists attached much fire and brimstone to Jewish perfidy, and that was because the Jewish experience was cast as history's exemplar for Indian missteps and Indian misfortunes. Jews, like Indians, refused to accept God's word, and both bore, in Avila and Avindanya's world history, the terrible outcomes. For neither Jews nor Andeans would accept God's word. Jews refused to believe in Christ's divinity. Andeans returned to the idolatry of their ancestors. Both the Jews and the Incas, Avila and Avindanyo harangued, had been at one time the lords of the land 
and had been their region's most prestigious and powerful naciones. Now they were the most despised. Here, here is the sermon that they preached. Don't you see how Jews condemned themselves? And 40, year, 40 years after Jesus' crucifixion, the Romans came with countless armed men and demolished Jerusalem, destroying it all and burning down the temple and killing everyone. Look how God lets nothing sinful transpire without punishment. And now we will speak a bit about your land and your ancestors and your kings, the Incas. During the reign, the entire land was boiling in sin, principally idolatry. And God wanted to enlighten the land. And just as God sent Captain Titus from Rome to Jerusalem, he sent Francisco Pizarro. And then more Spaniards went to Cusco, and they destroyed the temple where the Incas worshipped. And today, there is no longer the quantity of Indians that there used to be. The towns are desolate. The homes are falling apart. Don't you recognize that you had the same fate as the Jews? Avila asked his congregants to weigh the worth of Indians and Spaniards. But he continued. Hadn't Pizarro, with only 160 men, defeated the Inca Atahualpa, who had over 40,000 well-armed soldiers? Didn't the Spanish, with God's help, conquer Peru's natives because they wouldn't hear God's words? And hadn't Indians noticed how many of their kin and family had died? This was God's will. Spaniards, on top of the world, were blessed by God's might. To show um, fairness, though, or God's fairness, Avila also told his audience that if Spaniards displeased the Lord, they too would suffer all manner of devastations, too. Part of preaching Christianity, then, was to instruct ignorant natives to consider not only the inherent hierarchies of humanity found in history, but their global reach. Preachers had to traverse the globe. Indians didn't know that the earth was round. They also didn't know, quote, just how many different peoples there are in this whole wide world. I, I just found this so, just so fa fascinating, breathtaking. Some sermons then provided a global tour, a physical map and a political map with the outline of continents and major political units, and then more specific subdivisions. But preachers still had to show that these broad categories, these broad categories of Spanish, Negro, Indio, Blanco, uh, Colorado, in, uh, Negro, could cover over divisions, but that these divisions could also, in context, prove very telling and important. Again, the master race recognized throughout, throughout the land, throughout the world, but also covering over certain kinds of distinctions that might become of importance in different contexts. So Indians, native-born Indians, spanned the globe, and priests differentiated them. I um, thought you'd like to hear how they qualify them. Peruvians, along with Mexicans and Chilenos, were in the middle group of Indians, distinct on the one hand from the more polished Indians of China and Japan, and on the other, from the savages in the Amazon who, quote, run around naked in the jungle, unquote. Preachers and authorities in the Andes that work in a region that had been shaped by local empires for hundreds of years and by a colonial government that incorporated indigenous political hierarchies into their institutions of rule, expounded on these distinctions of rank and status as well. They spoke of differences between Indian commoners and superior Ladinos. Ladinos meaning literate, descendants of Incas and local middlemen, uh, local headmen who became middlemen in royal to royal authorities, and who were taught to read and write, and who enjoyed the privilege of not owing corvée labor, uh, labor to the crown. Preachers also underscored internal ethnic divisions, Koyao, Rukana, which are ethnic, uh, ethnicities in the Andes, but they also spoke about emerging Western polities within the European continent, Germany, France, or perfidious England. And of course, it's telling that they never made these kinds of distinguished differences when they spoke of Africa. To provide some uh, order to what Avila called all this beyond calculation, 
preachers turn to race thinking. Underneath this extraordinary diversity of God's languages, religions, towns, peoples, nations, and empires, we find two overlapping designs in their, in their sermons. In the words of the Doctrineros, here is all mankind, some white, some brown, some black. Or God is the creator of all men, Indians, blacks, and Spaniards. Missionaries made sense of the 17th century's vast and incalculable diversity by tracing racialized divides, divides enmeshed in colonialism over the multitude of God's creations. White, black, and brown abridged, abstracted versions of colonizer, slave, and colonized. However, the modern world's broad abstractions are a special character. Black, Indio, Espanol present themselves in discourse as if they were self-evident, a given of human experience. Preached by Avendano and Avila, these condensed abstractions would have us think that black people or white people existed independently of colonial, social, or political relations as if blacks, whites, or browns existed separately from Spain and Spanishness, as if whites, browns, blacks, Spaniards, and Indians could have existed one without the other, uh, as if slave or corvée laborer and master existed without each other, or that slave could exist without master or master without slave, and as if the abstractions themselves were not part of human history. Now, Spanish jurists and theologians were sparring seriously over the new Christian character during the 16th century, and the Spanish conquest brought added complication to debates, of, debates about ancestry and faith. For with colonization, Spaniards were challenging, were channeling pagan natives into the same new Christian state of being, and the viceroyalty of Peru's thousands of acolytes were, as a result, triggering fresh challenges to peninsular disputes. With debates spinning about the nature of bloodstains, were they indelible? Could baptism or accomplishments override them? Authorities in the Americas were vexed by such blood-related questions as, were the bloodstains of Europe's new Christians the same as the bloodstains of Indians or blacks? And then, were the stains of Indians and blacks equal? So now, tied to the big question, could Indians ever be good, could new Christians ever be good Christians, we find the colonial sequel were all new Christians alike. So first some, there was a lot of debate. First some official views. Jurists like Solorzano, the editor of the 17th century's premier compendium of laws governing the Americans, resolved the new Christian problem by deciding that new Christians were not all alike. Of course, they were somewhat alike. There was never any doubt that the colonial caste system subordinate groups Indians and blacks were infected with corrupt blood like their new Christian counterparts. But Indians and blacks became new Christians under different circumstances, Solorzano says, and therefore were subject to different ordinances. For example, although peninsular law prohibited descendants of Jews and Moors from government office, professions, and nobility, there was nothing to suggest that blacks and Indians could should suffer similar restrictions. Mm -hmm. Blacks and Indians, according to this reasoning, were of superior metal and would be capable of holding minor office. And so by comparison, <coughs> they carried stains that were easier to bleach. The equation, it took four generations of marrying white people for Indians and blacks to be reborn as Espanol. But now it took 200 years of marriage to old Christians for descendants of Moors and Jews to be reborn with pure white blood. So this tally represented an uh, official judgment, a shift in official, official judgment, and bureaucrats specializing in human nature used to give Europe's new Christians four generations too. But that was before conquest, the rigors of state making, and the necessities of colonization brought their own dialectic to bear on questions of personhood and stained blood. Now, on the page, Indians and blacks might be less stained than the new Christians, but in practice, these ideological requirements all the while were being systematically contradicted in colonial practice. How modern. So missionaries sent to evangelize Andean natives could hardly avoid these race matters, and they needed guidance. Alonso de Peña's guidebook for missionaries casts a telling light 
on how Peru's governing class made sense out of the irrationalities of race. He had to clarify concrete and very prickly issues, like could competent Indians and blacks be shut out of a religious calling because of impure blood? And then were they capable of, um, were they capable of preaching anywhere and to anybody? Or should their efforts be restricted to people of their same casta y generacion, cast or lineage? So how would pollutions, these manchas de sangre, affect the real possibilities of blacks and Indians in public life? at least officially, more um, deliberations. <clears throat> well, Pena cloned the existing literature, but his findings were very ambiguous. The experts' opinions on stains, stains derived from Indian blood, black blood, enslaved and free, and mixed blood, supported both sides of the debate. Sorting through this theological chaos, Pena, with his probability leanings, in his, um, in his long uh, justification, he pointed out that one of Rome's first bishops was of Jewish origin, after all. And so he sided with the underclasses. He said, Indians and blacks do not forfeit the right to be ordained on account of their origin, as long as they meet church standards, that they were competent and knowledgeable, moral and upright and legitimate. Peru's race-tinged prejudice, however, was an unavoidable presence, and Pena was forced to admit that the ordination of blacks would bring added complications to colonial realities. The colonial caste system making negros into slaves posed a particular set of problems, but the really troublesome issue was the awkwardness of color in a color-conscious world. Could blacks at the lowest rung in colonial society minister to Españoles? at the highest rung. Some experts, Pena discovered, argued that blacks should not because, quote, it would cause great horror to see a black person step to the altar to say mass for naciones blancas, literally white peoples, in Pena's writing. Other authorities, Pena assured us, very weighty ones, claim the opposite because in these parts there are blacks holding the rank of captain in other military offices. A black priest would not cause any revulsion. This being said, Pena had to acknowledge he was on weak ground. He found much less support in royal decrees and ecclesiastic orders or among the experts for Africans or their descendants to go out into the world and preach. And in the end, Pena had to admit that if asked to choose between sending a mestizo or a mulatto to minister to the countryside, he would choose a mestizo since mulatto blood had an uglier stain, una mancha más fea. So what are some unofficial understandings and agreements? Men and women living in colonial Peru across class and caste lines appear to increasingly see the world and judge the world in terms of race-based looks and fractures and agreed that human beings in the world could be divided into broad categories of black, indio, espanol, uh, and Espanol. However, these, however, how these configurations were used and understood often differed. Spanish New Christians and native New Christians had their own ideas about the meaning of New Christian, the significance of race, and what it would take to become an old Christian. Perhaps not surprising, they seem to agree on a few basics. For one, an old, who's an old Christian? Well, an old Christian is the child of a new Christian. In other words, it wouldn't, take 400, uh, it wouldn't take hundreds of years or even four generations, just one, to go from new to old. Um, Hernan Jorge, who was brought before the Inquisition for secretly Judaizing, was asked to characterize his ancestry, and he claimed that although his parents were new Christian descendants of Jews, he was an old Christian. And again, according to Juan Palma de Ayala, um, There he is. Um, the Andean nobleman and critic of the crown, and source of a great compendium of um, writings on the Andes. He says the children of baptized Christians were old Christians. He agreed. New Christians, Poma said, was just that the recently converted, Perus, Indios, and Negros. 
they would have agreed as well that to be Christian meant to worship Christ and be a member of a good standing in the church. So for both sets of new Christians, Christianity was a question of belief and practice, not ancestry. However, Spanish new Christians and native new Christians did not always have the same opinions about the emerging global and racialized colonial order. And um, as you can imagine, those who had pretense to the Espanol caste did not want to relinquish their rights to corvée labor or to, um, or to um, slaves or to privilege. But um, back to Juan Poma. Back, Juan Poma was an unrelenting supporter of, his, of, in his words, blood and lineage. And you'll see some of the other tensions running through these categorizations as they work out in government. The cornerstone in his, uh, in his opinion of any policy of good government, blood and lineage. His design for a just and well-ordered colonial society was built squarely on, notice of, uh, on notions of caste purity, both of caste, Spaniard, Indian, black, but also of status, nobility versus commoner. In homage to the racial and caste divisions of the modern colonial world, he would ideally partition all humans into three undefiled races, pure Spanish, pure Indian, and pure black. And each pure caste was to be ruled by a member of its own nobility. In other words, someone like Mama Poma, who considered himself from the nobility and therefore was very concerned about maintaining those caste differences, would govern Indians in Peru, who in turn would owe allegiance to the kingdom of Castile, like in Europe, with principalities owing allegiance to the king. Poma's vision joined race, government, place, and sovereignty in broad global strokes. Thus, he says, Castile belongs to Spaniards, and the Indies belong to Indians, and Guinea belongs to blacks. Poma argued that a successful colonial government ultimately depended on preserving strict boundaries between society's constituent groups. And he was as concerned about the lower orders within castes trying to become what they were not born to, as he was about caste members trying to pass from mestizo to Spaniard. And he says, and from Spanish peasant, they want to become lord. And from Indian tribute payer, they want to become Indian nobility. And by the way, this status passing was also a grave concern of aristocratic Spaniards who arrived in Peru, who were very upset when they saw mitayos, or Spanish peasants, trying to dress like the nobility in velvet and carry um, swords and have slaves. But combining both concern and as an obsession to native nobility, Poma urged Indians to marry their social equivalents and pressed Curacas, who were members of the colonial indigenous elite, to be sure that, quote, they do not give their daughters in marriage to either Indian peasants, that's Mitayos, use the Spanish term, or to Spaniards, but rather to their equals, so that a good caste, Buenacosta, is produced in this kingdom. Poma wrote but apocalyptically about the proliferation of Peru's malas castas, the stained, those are her, his words, illegitimate mixed breeds, mostly mestizo, but also mulatos and, and sambaegos, whose scandalous lives, in his judgment, seem to feed colonial disorder. Colonial caste mixtures were a ready target of Poma's scorn. But so was new Christian blood. In addition to mestizaje, Poma railed against the depravity of Jewish stains, calculating them to be more denigrating than the otherwise despicable, bastardly ones carried by mestizos. And in this context, Poma gave old Christian a similar valence as the inquisitors. Old Christian to him represented an overlap <coughs> of descent, religion, nation, and status. It meant Castilian, honorable, pure-blooded, and by implication, everything Jews were not. Now, of course, Juan Poma famously berated Spaniards um, for their un-Christian-like behavior, and in his famous critiques, called them less Christian than native Andeans, who might not have known Christ, but they still know how to, how to behave in a Christian way. Juan Poma ardently de uh, defended his global race triad, but at the same time, he ardently recognized that his global race triad was inadequate. 
For one, it papered over a variety of internal differences. Rank, of course, was one. So was the ethnic polities. And he berated Spaniards. He was insulted when they lumped Indians together as if they were one people. Um, he also berated, fair is fair, he also berated Indians for stereotyping Europeans in the same way. He says, wrong, they confused Castilian, foreigner, Jew, Moor, Turk, and Englishman. How does he recognize the white enemy? But again, he doesn't talk about, uh, about distinctions among African peoples. <coughs> so how do you recognize the white enemy? Well, Juan de Malacosta Blanca. Juan de Palma had a practical strategy to ensure that race and class purity would prevail. And that was that everybody in the vice royalty carry a blood purity ID. In spite of the risks, principally there's a burgeoning trade in phony documents, because people wanted to buy proof that they um, were pure-blooded so they could take on religious and professional uh, <coughs> positions. Purity of blood was a hot item. But he was convinced that state, um, verica state verification certificates would be the best, if not the only way, to approach the problem of illicit boundary crossing. How modern is that? <coughs> This is his word. How are we, if we don't have these certificates, how are we going to know if someone carries the stain of Jewish blood, or Moorish blood, or Turkish blood, or English blood? Or if he's a peasant, or a nobleman, or if he's a mestizo, or a mulatto, or a, neg or a negro? Now, there were some other Andean takes on the meaning of Indian, and one, uh, the one I want to mention used these divisions and distinctions to also as the basis for, for a political revolt. We can talk about that later. Um, some of Peru's natives also saw the world through Indian Spanish black boxes, but had a very different take on the meaning from Indian from either Juan Poma or Spanish authorities. Listen to the words of an Andean Curaca who lived in the Central Highlands. Indians, because we are Indians, should worship our ancestors since they are the ones who look out for the fertility of fields and the well-being of Indians. And only Spaniards should worship God and the painted saints which are in the church, since they are the gods of the Spanish. Some of Peru's native peoples, calling themselves Indians, were suspected of abandoning Catholicism for ancestral idolatries and bishops sent emissaries to the countryside to register, judge, and punish such heresies, which is how we know about them, because they resulted in trial, inquisition-like trials. And we have to remember, and it's often hard to do that, that before the Spanish conquest, there was no such thing as Indians. The Indians didn't see themselves as Indian, and except for those from Cusco, neither did they conceive of themselves as descendants or inheritors of the Inca. And that's still true today. Now, some self-proclaimed Indians, whose ancestors most likely fought against, fought against Inca dominance, were in the mid-17th century calling on the Inca to help right the wrongs of a colonial world run amok. Now the world is upside down, one minister prayed, and we, we are persecuted and in another time. These natives from Peru's central Sierra deliberately rejected Spanish religion wouldn't eat Spanish food or wear Spanish clothing, and to stop any miscegenation, kept young women from contact with Spanish men and ensured they were not being registered in Spanish colonial census rolls. These women became sacred beings, living in the Puna, in the high tableland, separate from the contaminations of Spanish life. They were becoming Indian. That is their colonial, their colonial version of Indian. It, appeals that it appears that colonialism's cultural politics also provided an idiom for protesting the status quo and resisting domination. This was a virulently anti-Spanish creed that encouraged adherents to remove themselves from the Spanish world as much as life would allow. It was a language of revolt that used colonialism's race-fractured visions but turned colonial hierarchies of race thinking and heresy upside down. Indians, because we are Indians, one indigenous priest says, 
should worship our gods and not the Spanish saints who are no more than painted sticks. So let's go back to 1639 to the great Alta de Fe celebrated in Lima. This was a great public ceremony of judgment. It was the public tableau of punishment for the great conspiracy of hidden Jews and was the bloodiest in Lima's inquisitorial history. Eleven were executed for crimes associated with Judaizing, and another 62 admitted guilt and were penanced. Inquisitors in Lima had to account for their actions to their superiors, to the Suprema in Madrid. This was a bureaucracy. Oops. And the inquisitional court in, in Madrid was concerned. Those in Lima justified their executions by appealing to the dangers new Christians posed not only to the ethical foundation of the colony, but to its very political security. Most inquisitors were dubious about the commitment of new Christians to Spain or to Catholicism. Loyalty, after all, was in the blood. Distrust, however, turned into alarm when Peruvian magistrates became convinced that hidden Jews had not only established ties with the European Dutch enemy, but with Indios and Negros, with whom they shared stained and sullied blood. The remarkable transformations in political economy, the growth of merchant capital and the growth of colonialism nurtured the tribunal's wildest fantasies of new Christian conspirators at the center of a great plot of foreign heretical usurpers from Europe and of oppressed colonial malcontents, Indians and Blacks. The so 17th century Peru provides an extraordinary example of how racialized fears could coalesce, develop, and balloon into absurd conspiracy theories, all with the help of officials with the power to destroy lives in the name of civilization, and all blinded by race thinking and the curse of sangre manchado, stained blood. Hannah Arendt believed that the modern colonial world was the precedent for the savagery of the 20th century, the West's subterranean stream of terror and violence that was to erupt in fascism. Our sense of modernity changes once we trace its elementary forms back to the 17th century. Nationalism and race thinking in concert propelled the modern world's most destructive beliefs. Yet we have trouble visualizing the depth of that connection because our historical sensibilities rarely put <coughs> colonialism at the core of modern life. The modern world, our world, from its inception, was transnational in scope and hierarchical in structure. These features are strikingly evident in the categories that were to order the newly globalized modern humanity, the categories of race thinking, along with the bureaucratic means to bring them into being. Race thinking joined to state making produced magical properties. Together they could make the social and political relations that constituted Indio, Negro, and Espanol seem to disappear. Securing European state making through its moorings and global expansion helps explain the cruelties and the irrationalities that have accompanied the development of the modern age. Cruelties made all the more dangerous by their coding in the rhetoric of reason and civilization, in the rhetoric of reasons of state, and in the rhetoric of race thinking, now part of the body politic. Tribunal archives tell the story of how human beings made bureaucrats, used bureaucratic procedures in their quest to determine the truth of imperial subjects. In their bureaucratic practices, Inquisitors were delineating the very terms of social experience, the terms by which the world was to be judged, and the terms forming any individual's social truth. These were the state truths, truths that were party to civilization and its violence, the deep social contradictions which aren't placed at the heart of the modern world in the making. Looking back from today through the 20th to the 17th century, you could only think that Hannah Arendt would see this as a cautionary tale, hidden and unheeded, perhaps condemned to erupt in, the 20, in its own 21st century guise.
Uh, I want to thank uh, Jill and Clax for organizing this and especially Pamela, Catherine, and Edgardo for inviting me to participate. And let me say it really is an honor to uh, comment on Irene's work tonight. Like uh, Pamela, I've been reading Irene for many years and learning from her for many years. And I really think that uh, her work on um, this on race thinking in the in the early modern in the colonial world is is very important really groundbreaking and I think the presentation tonight um, was uh, just uh, really really richly textured and fascinating and uh, and eloquent so um, I th her, her presentation tonight like in her book uh, in modern inquisitions Irene draws in very productive and stimulating fashion on Hannah Arendt's reflections on European imperialism as a basis for Nazi genocide in the 20th century. Now she recasts Arendt's arguments by looking backwards to the early modern period and to the south towards Iberia and the Americas. And this shift is important not only for understanding the past but also the present. Just as Arendt sought to make sense of her own time I think Irene's move helps us to think in a fresh light about race and racism in our own time. There's a strong prevalent tendency to look at race thinking in the 20th century and today as revolving around questions of color and scientific or pseudoscientific discourse. Um, phenomena that have developed approximately since the turn of the 19th century or maybe late 18th century and depending upon the interpretation people cite as causes for uh, the emergence of this focus on color and scientific racism, things like enlightenment thought, the boom in the slave trade, industrial capitalist takeoff, imperialist expansion, nation state formation, genetic and Darwinist theory. But I think that looking further backwards in time expands the scope of inquiry and allows us to think more amply about recent history. So Irene touches on questions of religion, ancestry, caste, nation formation, and other cultural matters as well as economic privilege, political domination, etc. All of which uh, are, would be fundamental to race thinking in the 17th century. When we begin to reflect on the significance of this, it becomes easier to see how race thinking in the 19th, 20th, and 21st centuries is likewise inflected by notions about descent, peoples and nations, religion, and other cultural manifestations. If indeed phenotype and biology have become central aspects of race thinking in our time, they have never been separate from other sorts of cultural identification and a broader conception of the way that the purported essences of peoples are reproduced over generations. To give an example, we can better grasp the depth of racial discrimination against Muslims or Syrian refugees in this country and Europe today from this longer term historical perspective that goes beyond phenotype and scientific classification. My own sense is that the historical scholarship is gradually taking more seriously the late medieval and early modern Iberian and American colonial origins of race thinking. Irene's book, Modern Inquisitions, came out in 2004, and as I said before, I think it really was a groundbreaking uh, study. Maria Elena Martinez's important monograph, Genealogical Fictions, Limpieza de Sangre, Religion and Gender in Colonial Mexico came out in 2008. And just thinking about our own context here at NYU, a number of colleagues have been grappling with uh, this problem of um, chronology, periodization, um, and the origins of race thinking. And so I think of uh, Karen Kupperman's work, Jennifer Morgan's work, um, and to cite a couple of recent examples, uh, Rebecca Getz's book, The Baptism of Early Virginia, How Christianity Created Race, uh, which came out in 2012, looks at Indians and the concept of hereditary heathenism in 17th century Virginia. And jean Frédéric Schaub's Pour une histoire politique de la race, which came out last year, 
similarly points to the medieval and early modern Iberian and Iberian American origins of racial discourse. There's a great deal of historical complexity to these questions of racialization, and it's not easy to think about them in very clear-cut fashion. Um, but based on Irene's uh, a paper that was sort of a, the basis for her talk today, um, I'd like to point to a few of the issues that I think we can pursue further. Um, I think that the talk tonight, you could see, she brings together a lot of very different issues in a very rich, very rich picture. Um, so I'm, I'm not going to be able to comment on the full range of things that she's brought up, but just maybe to stress a couple of points, um, in particular about institutions of power. Irene, drawing from Arendt, stresses the increasingly rationalized and bureaucratic nature of institutions, together with the history of racialization as the basis for the devastating effects of Western civilization. Arendt's story focuses straightforwardly on the state, but Irene's approach is somewhat paradoxical as the key institution that she focuses on uh, is the Inquisition. Perhaps I'm oversimplifying here, but I wanted to talk about the Inquisition in particular as a, as a point of focus, and uh, both the, what it allows us to, to understand as well as some of the limitations of um, thinking through that institution. In her paper, she argues that the Inquisition was the 17th century's most centralized and global bureaucracy. Irene's point is that the Inquisition had a bureaucratic structure and rationalist procedures, that there was a degree of overlap between secular and ecclesiastical institutions in Iberian America, and that the Inquisition fulfilled certain state-like functions, uh, such as preventing national subversion. But it also seems confusing to have the Inquisition stand in for the state. Uh, if the Inquisition was relatively autonomous from other instances of uh, ecclesiastical authority, it was also relatively autonomous from secular authority. This points us toward characteristics of the early modern state which have been described as composite or pluralist in its multiple jurisdictions, in its uneven or fragmented fields of sovereignty, in contrast with a later, more centralized, absolutist state form. If a bureaucratized regulation of purity of blood seems to be a similarly powerful feature of the Spanish Inquisition and the Nazi state, we're still talking about quite dissimilar institutions. Another complication with making the Inquisition the focus is that Indians were not subject to the authority of that institution, only non-Indians were. Um, though Indian identity and Indian understandings are also part of the history that she's writing about and that we've heard about tonight. Um, and as, as we heard, in Indians are subject to persecution through campaigns of uh, extirpation of idolatry that were managed by other ecclesiastical authorities. The operations of the Inquisition were also not particularly distinct in the colonial context compared to that of the old world to my knowledge. I'm not sure there was something distinctively colonial about its regulation of purity of blood. Might be something to, to think about more. But Irene is undoubtedly right to hone in on the religious dimension of Iberian race thinking in the early modern period, as the obsession with purity of blood was transitioning from an Iberian context where racial identification was first and foremost about one's religious affiliation and ancestry to the New World context where religious differences were partly attenuated. Everyone, Indians, blacks, mestizos, and mulatos, and Spaniards were ostensibly Christian. But, uh, but again, the, uh, the religious dimension remained very much present as, as we heard tonight, the, the concern with um, uh, Protestant uh, enemies, uh, the concern with the idolatry of indigenous people, and so forth. Um, and I agree with the thrust of Irene's argument that the colonial context anticipated the development of absolutist state formation and race thinking in Europe. But to take Irene's argument further, I think we can consider more the role of secular, the secular colonial state and look more closely at some of its racializing mm -hmm. operations. A number of early modern historians tend to see Spain's New World governance 
as a fairly straightforward extension of political structures and political culture on the peninsula. It was, in this view, a single and unified Hispanic imperial realm. To the point that many of these historians suggest that colonialism is, in fact, an inappropriate category to use before the Bourbon period in the 18th century. But I think there were, indeed, significant differences. Spanish rule in the Americas was distinct from Habsburg governance on the Iberian Peninsula in that it had more effective centralizing pretensions. The crown in Peru had <coughs> waged a war to prevent conquistador elites from reproducing the very feudal power that existed back on the Iberian Peninsula, and it was quite successful in its campaign. Viceroy Toledo was also relatively successful in mounting a fairly unified and centralized state structure in Peru in the 1570s, at least by uh, later standards. We can think about the role of the state in producing racialization, for example, through its legal and institutional identification of particular subjects, beginning with Indians, who were distinguished as a separate nation or people from Spaniards, as in the distinction made between the Republic of Indians and the Republic of Spaniards. Some colonial historians would resist the idea that this dual republics framework was a form of racial categorization because it was not defined by color or it was a social and cultural form of categorization rather than a biological one. Yet I think it can be seen as racializing if we admit that race thinking in this period reflected ideas about the reproduction of different peoples or nations of different lines of ancestral descent and geographical provenance as race, race thinking has continued to do down to the present. In another contrast with the old world, Indians were forced to pay tribute to the crown, unlike poor Spaniards who were exempted from paying it, though they had to pay taxes as commoners back on the Iberian Peninsula, because Indians were conquered subjects. Even after conversion to Christianity, which ostensibly offered them equality with other Christians in the eyes of God, and even after partial limits were set on the enslavement of Indians in the 16th century, they were set apart in the eyes of the state and racialized, I would argue, because of their condition as a conquered people. Racialization also took place through everyday operations of the state as when the culturally and linguistically diverse peoples of the Andes were cast homogeneously as Indians in legal, census, and other sorts of bureaucratic proceedings. This sort of production of Indian identity is a topic that seems fairly obvious, but I, one that I think has not received sufficient research. My comment here has been focused on institutions of power, but as Irene points out, Indians themselves developed conceptions of collective identity that were increasingly racialized in the colonial period, though their conceptions could diverge from those of Spaniards. Again, these conceptions were not limited to notions of color and biology, but neither was racial discourse in Latin America in, sub in subsequent centuries limited in this way. An example would be Wampoma's vision according to which Castillo belongs to Spaniards and the Indies belong to Indians and Guinea belongs to blacks. As Relena Adorno has pointed out, this formulation was one that Wampoma had appropriated from the radical later propositions of Bartolomé de las Casas, questioning the legitimacy of Spanish sovereignty in the New World. While Wamampoma may have been an idiosyncratic character, the native and subaltern conceptions that Irene has explored remain a rich vein for future study. And these popular conceptions of collective identity provide an entree for us to understand not only how dominant ideologies penetrated the worlds of colonized peoples, and work to pit subalterns against one another in colonial society, but also how subaltern groups could refashion their own sense of themselves in ways that challenge the forms of colonial and racial domination. So I just want to end by, again, highlighting the rich and provocative analysis that Irene has given us of race and colonial power relations. And I have no doubt they will remain a key reference point for us in ongoing research debate and discussion. And we can con continue that discussion right now. Uh, we have time for some questions for Irene um, and uh, dialogue. So I'd invite you all to, um, for Irene to
come up front and for all of you to <coughs> share some of your reactions or raise any of the questions that her presentation has brought up for you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to, I don't know if everyone can hear, um, I mean, I really love the talk and the book and I'd love to see the, the article. Uh, and, yeah, okay, it's on. And uh, my question is that I've, I've just noticed uh, something odd about purity of blood statutes. Just comparing Spanish ones with those that are produced in the context of the Indies, there's a there seems to be a really big shift in them, or something that strikes me as <clears throat> is really very significant. And I, I wonder if you have noticed that, or if, if you have, if if you can, I don't know, help to account for it. I'm I'm trying to come up with an answer myself. But in the, in the Spanish case, almost invariably, uh, uh, the, the kinds of stain include manual labor, being descended from a manual labor, having the, the uh, mancha de pechero. And, and that's because it seems to me that almost all of the, the statutes written in Spain are to exclude pecheros from kinds mm -hmm. of, of honorable office that are restricted to people who are Hidalgos or aristocrats, right? So you want to keep out all of those people who are stained by engaging in manual labor in a kind of understanding of, of purity that sounds very, I don't know, Vedic, right? Uh, 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 to be pure is not to labor, not to get dirty, etc. cetera. Uh, and, and yet that seems to drop out of the statutes in the new world. Um, and I'm, I'm not sure that it drops out because the focus shifts into racial thinking, or if, in fact, dropping it uh, is a product of some, what happens to Spaniards in the New World, uh -huh. where they're all de facto aristocrats, and yet almost none of them really are, right? There are almost no real Hidalgos, right. and where, the, where, where if they were to apply the purity of blood statute that existed in, I don't know, Toledo or Cuenca, most of the Spaniards themselves would be excluded from, uh, from whatever uh, kind of office that they're, they're being developed for. Uh, and I don't know, that seems to me to have the consequence of then I identifying stain with something that's about an embodied form of difference other than social estate. Right? And where social estate is the key difference between what, is to, what it is to be white, that is kind of an aristocrat, a pure person, and what it is to be uh, uh, among the conquered peoples. You know, that's as far as I can get in trying to imagine what the consequences of this are. But to me, it's just really fascinating that all of the early forms of these statutes include as a kind of impurity of blood uh, any uh, being within four generations of someone who's plowed you know uh, that's the question let's really must say something about the needs of colonial of the colonial world in peru of how you have to do off your hat, at least, to the Spaniards who are, who are arriving and who have to also make a distinction between themselves and um, those who are being colonized, which was not needed. And that's fascinating. I didn't know that's uh, it's fascinating. I, I wonder if they ever emerge, if there are times when they emerge in the new world. Do you know? Do you know? I'm not sure. And I, could, I can say that in, it's it's typical of, of really early 16th century um, uh, Provences de Meritos y Servicios to talk about one's genealogy, right, and list the four generations, and, and if, when they can, they will say, yeah, uh, 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 Hidalgo all the way, from a solar conocido without a mancha of, of trabajo, 
Manawahu is basically what mm -hmm. the description. And and then later that's dropped in, well, because most of them can't meet it. But those who can, who want to claim Idalgia, you know, will do that. But um, that's in their own pleas to the king for recompense directly from the king. And, and uh, say, a statute that's produced for uh, a cabildo for whether or not you can belong to the cabildo of Potosi is not going to include that, that item. Different worlds. Do they have a market in um, forgery, forged blood purity certificates? Do you know? Well, I don't, you know, I, I can't say that I've ever seen something that I would call a blood purity certificate per se. Uh. Yeah. Um, but they uh, but tend to be really long expedientes mm -hmm. with, uh, I don't List know, of ancestry, uh, 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 yeah. uh, listing one's genealogy and how wonderful it was and all the services, uh, part of a, a, a service record, a curriculum vitae, and then a bunch of witnesses who will testify that that's all true and that I know for a fact or this publicly known that that person. And I'm not sure that there was a market in f uh, that, that you had to forge them. I think actually just bought witnesses and... and or brought forgings, but yeah, right. You yeah, I mean, you had to pay for the process and get the scribe to produce right. the, the document, but uh, it could all be lies. Right. invite you to respond to, um, um, I guess, any of the points that Sinclair mm. raised, but I was very interested in your, mm. in your point about the autonomy of the Inquisition and how mm. that relates back to thinking about the role of the state. I mean, have mm. that yeah. caused yeah, thoughts yeah. for you, questions? Mm. Yeah, I have to think yeah. about, about mm -hmm. what you said because it was very, very um, Provoking in it reminded me of my own limits, mm. Mm. <laughs> and so I, I want to, I want to think about that. You're, and you're right, and I want to think about that carefully. Um, and of course, different institutions played had, had their roles were at, or different valences according to where they were and what the needs were at the particular time yeah. as well. Yeah. So. Um, I'm sure in certain parts of different cities, coastal cities, the Inquisition mm -hmm. was quite, was, had a kind of presence that it might not have had in, yeah. in different parts of, um, of the Andes. Right. But I, um, I was surprised reading the records to see how obsessed they were with getting information back from Lima to Madrid, no matter how many months it took for documents to go back and forth, mm -hmm. including documents of prote protest mm -hmm. by the outlier inquisitor in a tribunal mm -hmm. who argued that even the uh, even these other guys were stronger than were more numerous and seemed to be more persuasive that he wasn't convinced of their righteousness and that he would I don't know if bureaucrats would have the courage to do that mm -hmm. <laughs> to, mm -hmm. to write that to his to Supremo and mm -hmm. then to for court trials to actually wait for mm -hmm. records to come back mm -hmm. showed a kind of presence that I was quite that quite surprised me. Yeah. Yeah. I, I what I really liked about the presentation tonight is I think you could see all these different strands um, of currents through which race thinking is developing. Yeah. So yeah. the Inquisition is one, oh, one right. current. And then you have the sermonizers who are not a part of the inquisitional no. structures at no. all who are doing their own work. Right. And, and then I was trying to bring up other forms of secular state yeah, which uh, is production, really right. which seems obvious. But again, I think right. there's but a lot more work that we could do in all these realms, be, as yeah. well as the everyday ways in which through yes. human interaction, these these ideas are um, taking shape yes. and, and, or being reshaped. Um, so they're just all the all these different angles of approach to the to the 
topic, and I think all of them really lend themselves to more, more work and reflection. Right, and interaction. I, mean, yeah. I think it would right. be wonderful to work in teams so yeah. that we could, you know, we know how long it takes to get through records, yeah. and um, then to really have a, the ability to compare yeah. what we have and to see the relative weights and how they yeah. interact, which we might not see if we don't ask yeah. those kinds of questions. Yeah. Like, I found fascinating the, your analysis of the, these, the sermons and the discourses of these doctrineros. Um, and the, the global historical perspective yeah. that they had. Also the language of whiteness I found interesting because that's something I haven't seen much of in my own no. work in the 18th century in the countryside. Mm. The, the language of whiteness is quite rare until the last couple decades of the 18th century from what I've seen. Um, and I know there's scattered references to this earlier but I felt like I was getting more of a handle on that through through those sources in, that you presented. And versus, of course, you realize it was just good luck that I kind of fell upon mm. these sermons. Otherwise, mm. I wouldn't have known. Yeah. But when I read about, when I read, uh, when I read Avendaño talking about naciones blancas, I, I just yeah, I've never encountered <laughs> that before. Never, never, <laughs> never. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder. I also find that really fascinating. And and I, you know, I, I would agree. I would have said no. They didn't. Uh, they didn't use that term mm -hmm. right. on the basis of reading sort of everyday yeah. documentation right. or looking at I don't know baptismal records. Nobody's ever yeah. listed as being yeah. blanco until yeah. it's really the end of the 18th century mm -hmm. that, that it suddenly mm -hmm. pops up and yeah. it gets generalized. And I wonder if it has something to do with the I don't know educational level. I mean, if, if these uh, preachers are actually trying to to put the conquest into a kind of global, you know, global I panorama, mm -hmm. I think they absolutely were. Then they're engaging in some kind of comparative ethnology, we could say. And then they have the mm. problem of, of, you know, what it is that uh, that Englishmen and Dutchmen and Italians and other Catholics uh, have to do with being Spanish. Yes. And and so how do you bring the Italians into the, you know, or whatever, the, 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 the those that are outside of the kingdoms of Spain but that are Christian and European mm -hmm. into the picture? And what term could you use? And when that's I wonder the problem, if that's when uh, yes. they invent it. I think so. And these are not actual legal, they're not used in legal documents. These are used as ser in sermons. So there could be a kind of understanding that goes mm -hmm. outside of it's certainly outside the formal legal yeah. uh, jurisprudence, but that is known in the street, or right. that is known as how people talk about each other. Mm. And maybe that, maybe that's part of it. Because that's the, the the conflict of of these categorizations in the colonial world is that you, on the one hand, need to make these uh, global mm. categories. On the other hand, global categories are never sufficient. Mm. I mean, there's always details and divisions that need to be raised or need to be hidden at different times. Mm -hmm. There was a question in back there. Yeah, thank you so much for the discussion. Okay. Actually, the, the woman oh. behind you. Okay. Okay. I can, um, sorry, I can't just see a back there. small reference uh, that I was curious about. Um, and the talk had to do with the, regi the racialization of Portuguese. Mm -hmm. You mentioned oh, yeah. that very briefly. Mm -hmm. That's something I had to come across. I wonder, I wonder if there's more to be said about that particular reference, but in particular in the context of a, uh, thinking comparatively uh, about the Americas, how the Portuguese will come to confront similar issues, but in an entirely different way of regime in the com um, colonies that they'll encounter and they will try to forge. Mm -hmm. um, and if there's already a pervading discourse of racialization of Portuguese and something other than pure, um, I wonder if that enabled um, a more malleable kind of um, uh, uh, racial regime in places that were not um, Spanish America. And that would be an interesting story, just separate from the one that we, I think, commonly understand that has to do primarily with the kinds of civilizations that the Spaniards um, encountered in the areas that they colonized as opposed to those that the Portuguese encountered, right? So that's on one hand, I mean, um, Tom was really fascinated by that um, story you mentioned because if you trace it just maybe another 100 years, um, 150 years, 
barriers to the, you know, the rites of Catholic paintings and some zonas and, and whatnot, you see a return to the um, conflation of, of class and estate and race as a marker of, um, of, of hierarchy. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, to some extent, the, you know, if, if you track that um, over time, you might say that in the context of the Americas, the suspension of a state as a marker of hierarchy, in part because of the dynamics that you mentioned, then um, allows for the much stricter racialization of hierarchy. But, but then it returns to its origins, which seem to be the preservation of, um, of, of you know, class privilege. So I mean, I'm curious to see how that develops. Would it be okay with you to take a couple more questions as well and yeah. bring them together? Sure. Just so we can give everybody but, but a chance. I think my, yes, that's good. I'm just my. Um, I don't know how I how much oh, I can remember everything. Okay. But, but please go, go ahead. Go, go <laughs> ahead. Why don't you yeah. go one by one? Um, no, I think the Portuguese instance is very it's, it's very complicated and and fascinating. Um, I'm becoming increasingly interested in the ways in which. Um, Raci um, racialized stains based on religion become attached to political groups, and that was certainly part of fascist development. It's part of um, today's conflicts in Eastern Europe, also. So, again, today's world makes me think about the times in the past, and in it's, it's my understanding, and you all can help that um, there was a particular history of those of after the expulsion of many Jews who wanted to keep on practicing Judaism or, um, would, went to Portugal. I think half of, I think 50,000 did, where they were able to practice Judaism freely until, I, I'm sorry, I don't remember exactly when, where they also then had to go underground. So there was a stereotype in, in Spain about Portugal being overrun by hidden Jews. To the degree that I remember coming across documents uh, that were um, where men of Portuguese ants from Portugal, part of the Portuguese principalities, were expressing outrage. You Castilians, all you do is say we're Jews. We're not Jews. We're Christians. You know, and people who were who were old who called themselves also old Christians, but felt maligned by stereotypes. And I think this is a, also a wonderful example about, about stereotyping and how, how different aspects come together and they're broken apart, but it's um, part of the cultural politics of the time. Okay, Amalia and then Karin. Uh, I want to make some <laughs> commentary. Uh, in, at the end of 16th century, in the first uh, Quechua dictionary written by Domingo de Santo Tomas, we can find the definition of the word llana. In Quechua language, originally llana, the meaning of llana was only referred to a color, yes. black color. Right. But when the, uh, the first dictionary, the first missionaries, uh, wrote the first dictionary, in this case, Domingo Santo Tomas, manipulate the definition, the concept, uh, related only to the color. So in the first definition in the dictionary of Domingo Santo Tomas is llana, it means black, it means a uh, mujer u hombre negro. And at the end, he uh, registered the uh, the definition related to color. No? So we have registered the, the manipulation of the meaning, of the original meaning mm -hmm. of this word. Yes, yeah, that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's important. Thank you. That's an important thing to recognize. I don't know if you remember, but weren't there also songs in the Ayacucho region that talked about Yana, not just Yana Nyawi, but used Yana also as an interesting term of endearment. It is. <laughs> I, I can't quite come up with any <laughs> examples. Yes. yes, it has 
you know, it sort of It's a funny, inverts. yeah, inverts, yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. You know, in Thank Spanish so it translates Mi Negrita too. Mi Negrita. Yeah. Thank you for your um, wonderful talk, I mean, it's a pleasure. Um, I was wondering if the state uh, also found any references on the um, Manchamo Mariano or the, the, mar the marking on the back, which is also another marker of indigeneity. I'm sorry. What what mancha? It's um it has the informal name of mancha Boliviana. It's a stain or a color, a darkening of the back. Como no se llama? It's called mancha Boliviana. I don't know if it appears mm. in the literature at that time. Mm. It's only it's in on babies. Yeah. They're born. So oh, they're so born. babies. Yes, these are babies. Um, What's the other term? La cincha. La cincha. And it comes, the, the cincha term refer, uh, comes from the saddle, the uh, part of the saddle for horses, which, which left an imprint on the back of the horses, so hmm. from analogy. That's a very interesting word. <laughs> Do you know if the term yana, if, is there, are there records that show the, its continuity of use in the way that you t described it? Are later dictionaries, do later dictionaries use yana in that way? Do you know? After the Migos de Santo Tomas? Uh, what I know is that after that, yeah, I'm curious. Meaning, yeah. it comes to uh, Yananti, for example, mm -hmm. but it comes from the bear of uh, Yana bias to help. That is right. why it becomes in uh, Yana is my my girlfriend. Right, right. But the uh, people, and this is in the, in the Spaniard concept, Yananti indeed means Yana means servant, sirviente, and that is not the, the original meaning. It was girlfriend or boyfriend. Mm -hmm. That is a confusion of mm -hmm. concept. Um, definition. Mm -hmm. Karen? Mm -hmm. Well, I have a comment and then a question. My question is really out of left field. So, <laughs> but my comment is just about the, the Portuguese. There's a English, uh, Anthony Parkhurst in 1578 was waiting for some salt that was supposed to, the Portuguese were supposed to bring him on the coast of Newfoundland. And he lost his uh, uh, cargo of fish because they never appeared. And he says the Portuguese are descending of the Jews and he Judas. Does. Kind. And Judas and Jews. So it's not just, right? Uh, but anyway, my question was, I mean, this is something I've, I've wondered about for a long time, and it may be just too out of the realm of what you're talking about here. but. You talked about globalizing. Mm. It has always struck me as so interesting that Congo was a Christian nation and that there were bishops, not only priests, but also bishops who were Congolese. And I wondered if there's any discourse of this sort around that, because I know they were present at the Vatican and, and were, you know, were, they didn't seem to be differentiated from European priests and bishops. Well, I, I know in some of the descriptions of, of justifications of could a priest of, of African origin preach to white, a white audience, that one of the qualifications was, well, yes, there are priests who are black. So there was a recognition of that existence or of Africans who were captains in the Peruvian in the army, so it's it is recognized. The question is that the um, the painter brings up his bowl is that is it enough? Is it sufficient, or is that really going to counter larger prejudices? What what will the larger the implication of the broader prejudices be? But it is re it is it's yeah it is it is recognized. Yeah. But you know I've never I've rarely seen references to Congo. I've only seen references to black. Which it is striking to me that in the records, the, the Inquisition records, the trial records, and other kinds of um, 
recyclables, so public documents of sale. It's very rare to see to see someone's African origin be specified the way the way other origins are, whether ethnic mm. groups are. Mm. It happens sometimes, but not very often. Sometimes I saw in sales, you'd say Angola, Congo, but sometimes those also became just c categories, not necessarily, I don't think, referring to place or social group. Well, and I think later, at least again in the English colonies, they tended to, to attribute certain kinds of behavior patterns mm -hmm. to people from certain parts mm -hmm. of Africa. And so they would categorize people on the basis of their behavior as being from a certain uh, part of Africa. Right. <laughs> One more question. Thank you. Maybe um, just a, a comment, but also maybe a question if you if you want to uh, maybe expand a little bit on this. But I would like to introduce a certain element of uncertainty, um, <laughs> which is what John Frederick Shaw always reminds us of, right, when we talk about the early modern period, a lot of these things are very uncertain and there's a lot of the frameworks in which things op operate are very are very loose, right? And so one of those elements of uncertainty, I think, it's how the specific bureaucrats in the society interact with other people or what the nature of the relationship between a, a specific bureaucrat and a social in a local community is. And of course, that's an evolving nature, right? And so when a bureaucrat and again, right, these are very specific. There are notarios, there are escribanos, there are secretarios, all sorts of people with specific um, privileges, right, and obligations within this society. Um, but their relationship with those who they, for whatever reason, describe on paper, in written, those relationships evolve over time, right, over the course of their, li their own lifetimes. And so many historians, going back to the 60s and 70s, realize that in the records, people usually sleep, the same individual or the same family could sleep in and out of different quote unquote categories, right? That over the course of his or her lifetime, lifetime, someone could be referred by the same escribano, right, or notario, um, that these same individuals could be referred to as mestizos in some instances, then in some other instance, you know, 20 years down the road or maybe two, they could be referred to as indios um, and Joanne Rappaport has written a whole book on this, so I also wanted to, <coughs> excuse me, mention that book to complement your list of interesting books that you gave Sinclair, The Disappearing Mestizo by, by Joanne Rappaport. Mm -hmm. So there is a certain element of, you know, the bureaucrat, the bureaucrat in, in his specificity has um, a, certain, a certain degree of uncertainty in the ways that they True. deal with uh, with these names or categories. I mean, the ways that they mm -hmm. deal with their clients sometimes, right? We think about escribanos, but also this, their subordinates, if we, if we think about jueces or alcaldes. Um, and that's something, I think that's something very in, important to remember yes. because I really like that you're trying to make a very solid, I think, overarching argument about the role of the bureaucrat. And so I just wanted to mention that, you know, the element of uncertainty and the element of subtlety regarding what a bureaucrat was in this period. No, I think that's important, important to remember. Uh, I certainly wouldn't, wouldn't want to give the impression that you have some kind of generic stamp um, creating people in, in a particular way because the, the, the function that you have to global design, how they actually are put in practice is a very different kind of question of course, and that will depend on the kinds of context that you're talking about. So it's a good reminder. <laughs> Just a short comment. Uh, the way you used um, the sermons, sermons mm. as pedagogical processes where yeah, education is, is, is a form that also forms states. Mm -hmm. I think that to me is a very mm -hmm. key point that you're making 
Okay, uh, let's uh, thank Irene for a wonderful presentation oh, tonight. Thank you. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, really, it's, it's meant so much to me to be here with you and honestly to see people mm -hmm. who I haven't seen in too long. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. a real pleasure. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you.